Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Megan Gallagher. To ask the Scottish Government whether it produces guidance for local government on how allegations of sexual misconduct against councillors should be handled. Minister Ben McPherson. The guidance on handling such complaints is produced by the Independent Ethical Standards Commissioner. Allegations of sexual misconduct against a councillor whilst performing their duties should be dealt with by the Ethical Standards Commissioner as a breach of the councillor's code of conduct. Moreover, if a criminal offence may have taken place, then that should of course be dealt with by Police Scotland. Sexual misconduct is an issue which all parties should and do take very seriously, which is why the Scottish Government are currently taking forward measures to prevent individuals on the Sexual Offenders Register from being councillors. Megan Gallagher. Presiding officer, last week an SNP councillor who claims to have been sexually assaulted by former North Lanarkshire Council leader demanded reform over how the SNP handles sex complaints. This is the third claim of sexually inappropriate behaviour made against this individual. Instead of supporting victims, North Lanarkshire SNP closed ranks. One councillor even claimed that Mr Linden had done nothing wrong and the only thing he was guilty of was being young. So can I ask the Minister if he agrees with me that victims should be protected by political parties and do you think that councils should have additional measures in place for councillors should political parties fail to support them? Thank you, uh, Minister, on matters for which the Scottish Government has general ministerial responsibility. Thank you, President Officer. Um, as, a, as a, you have alluded to, I cannot comment uh, with regard to uh, political parties. However, I, I would refer to the member, the member to my, my first answer. Um, it is unacceptable um, that people and, and, and considerations about how we move forward, and it is ex unacceptable that people who are potential predators uh, could be uh, councillors, which is why um, we are undertaking uh, measures to uh, improve matters, which is why uh, we are taking forward a review of Section 31 of the Local Government Scotland Act uh, 1973 to bar individuals uh, who, uh, or who are on the Sex Offenders Register from being councillors uh, and, and, and continuing to uh, consider matters within the Code of Conduct. Thank you. Question number two, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what its initial assessment is of the potential impact of the Windsor framework on Scotland's economy. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, we welcome the Windsor framework, which offers an opportunity for the UK to reset its relationship with the European Union. However, the Prime Minister, by setting out his view that the framework puts Northern Ireland in an unbelievably special position, has accepted that Scotland is not a major competitive disadvantage and has made crystal clear the immense damage the UK Government's hard Brexit deal is causing to Scotland. Despite voting overwhelmingly to remain, Scotland has been forced out of the EU out of the single market, of the customs union, and we have lost freedom of movement rights, which was so important to the Scottish economy. The Office for Budget Responsibility confirmed last week that as a result of Brexit, long-run UK productivity will fall by 4% which is the equivalent to a loss in annual national income of around £100 billion compared with continued EU membership. Given this hard Brexit supported not just by the current UK Government, but also by the Labour Party, it is clearer than ever that it is only by becoming an independent country that Scotland can regain the huge economic benefits of EU membership. Claire Adamson. I thank the Minister for his an answer and concur with my concerns over the Office of Budget Responsibility report. Can he give any comfort to Scottish businesses right now who will continue to suffer by a damaging hard Tory Brexit and what he can give them in terms of comfort as they look across to Northern Ireland and see the advantages that Northern Ireland will have over Scottish businesses with access to the free market. Minister. Yeah, of course, we recognise, as I've said in my earlier answer, the damage that this can do to the prospects of Scottish business. And, of course, the Scottish Government continue to work with businesses in Scotland to support them as best we can, given the damage that the UK Government is doing by uh, these steps. The people in Scotland are given a clear mandate for a referendum on Scotland's future. Scotland, of course, has huge economic potential, but the UK economy, particularly post-Brexit, is now lagging behind many EU and international comparators. So should the people of Scotland vote for independence when given a choice, Scotland will get the full range of powers and the ability to rejoin the EU to build a country that is wealthier, more successful and fairer than the UK. Yeah. 
Question number three, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will begin to set out its proposals for the NHS Scotland Infrastructure Investment Plan post-2026 in relation to new build hospitals. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. An exact timeline has not been agreed for when the next Scottish Government Infrastructure Investment Plan for 2026 and the following five years will be published, but in line with previous iterations of the plan, are expected to be published in late 2025. Edward Mountain. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I wrote to you, Cabinet Secretary, and all other SNP leadership candidates last week, asking if you would support a new acute general hospital for the Highlands and Islands to replace Raig Moore. I know you've been very busy and have been unable to give me an answer. So now is your opportunity, Cabinet Secretary. Do you support my call? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, replying back to Conservative MSPs should have been my priority. Forgive me that I hadn't got round to Edward Mountain. But let me say to him that I'm very proud, very proud of Scottish Government. They might want to listen to the answer. I'm very, very proud of Scottish Government investment in our highlands and, and, and islands. Uh, Scottish Government, of course, we are supporting, and I announced £5 million of capital investment in upgrading maternity services at Ragmore. A Highland National Treatment Centre has an investment of £48.5 million. I have had the pleasure, as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, to open two new community hospitals, one in Aviemore and one in Skye, in September 2021 and March 2022, respectively. In terms of uh, Ragmore, there is no doubt at all that Ragmore will require significant investment, either through a full refurbishment or indeed replacement. And of course, we'll work closely with the NHS Highland to identify the best way forward. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise as to when we are likely to see construction of a new Crosshouse Hospital in Ayrshire? The UK Government promised 14 new hospitals in England, the construction of which has been hampered by a lack of cash, is year behind, years behind schedule and moving at a glacial pace, to quote Saffron Cordery, Interim Chief Executive of NHS Providers. We don't want to follow the Tories' appalling example. Cabinet Secretary. Indeed, indeed. And of course, uh, investment in our infrastructure, investment in health and social care uh, is, is challenging because of, of course, the Conservatives' economic vandalism, which means that at peak inflation, our budget is worth, uh, health and social care budget alone, is worth less by £1.2 billion. The Scottish Government budget worth less by the amount of one. £0.7 billion. The NHS Ayrshire and Anne are working on their Caring for Ayrshire programme, which is an exciting, it's an ambitious programme that will transform health and care services right across Ayrshire and uh, Arran. Uh, their vision is that care shall be delivered as close to home as possible, uh, supported by a network of community services with safe and effective and timely access uh, to specialist services. As part of that programme, NHS Ayrshire and Arran are, con are considering their acute health care estate, which of course includes Cross House Hospital and what that will look like in the future. Uh, the Government will be fully supportive of this approach and we look forward to discussing their plans with the Board uh, when they are ready. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Earlier this week, the Health Committee heard evidence from health boards regarding external pressures on their service delivery, including the impact of inflation and increased utility costs. So, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if the Government have considered how to reduce revenue energy cost as part of the infrastructure investment plan proposals, for example, through capital investment in systems like district heat networks, which could increase sustainability of the hospital estates and support surrounding communities? Cabinet Secretary. Now we have, and there are excellent examples of where we are uh, introducing uh, such efficient systems. And of course, we have an ambition, and I'm happy to make sure this uh, strategy is forwarded on to Pulse. We need to make sure that we decarbonise our entire uh, health and social care estate. Uh, I would also point out to the fact that we have, of course, increased investment in the health service, or will be increasing investment in the health service in the next year's budget by a record, uh, to a record, I should say, £19 billion. Question number four, Colin Smith. By £19 billion. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to tackle the reported exodus of dentists from NHS dentistry. Minister Marie Todd. The Cabinet, the cabinet, cabinet not Can we have the Minister's microphone? Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care wrote to all NHS dental teams on 7 February, confirming the continuation of the bridging payment to 31 October 2023, while we prepare for the implementation of payment reform. Payment reform will comprise a new modernised system that will provide NHS dental teams with greater clinical discretion and transparency for NHS patients. It is our intention for payment reform to maintain the confidence of NHS dental teams by ensuring the future viability of NHS dentistry in Scotland. Colin Smith. 
The Minister referred to the confidence, but the reality is, and she'll know from the crisis in Dumfries and Galloway, no one can actually currently register with an NHS dentist. Practices in Dumfries and in Castle Douglas Thornhill have deregistered 20,000 patients. Crucially, those that are registered, half of them haven't seen an NHS dentist for over two years. Now, given that the research from the British Dental Association, who warned about this exodus, shows that well over half of dentists have actually reduced their NHS work. What assessment has the government actually made to changes to the whole time equivalent NHS dentist workforce since lockdown? And what guarantee will the Minister give that my constituents will actually get to see an NHS dentist? Minister. So there's no doubt that there are strong existential forces working on the dental workforce at the moment in Scotland. We are working through the backdrop of a pandemic which prevented work in dentistry for nearly a year and impacted on it for quite a period after that. We had a whole year of dental students not qualify and we had Brexit happen. In the area that you mentioned, Dumfries and Galloway, one in two of the dentists were European. So the Scottish Government has put in place a framework of support to encourage more dentists to work in remote and rural areas, including in areas of the south of Scotland. That includes the Scottish Dental Access Initiative, which provides capital funding of up to £100,000 for the first surgery, £25,000 per additional surgery to dental providers setting up a new practice. And also, we've got an enhanced recruitment and retention allowance of up to £37,500 for newly qualified training. And we've put in place that framework to help mitigate the worst effects of Brexit on the reducing supply of dentists to Scotland. Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since Brexit, the rate of EU and EFTA dentists joining the register has halved, even though the opposition would deny this. Given that, can the Minister provide an update on the steps the Scottish Government is taking to improve access to NHS dental services in those areas which are particularly affected by these challenges? Minister. The Member is absolutely correct that the consequences of Brexit are invariably having a disproportionate impact on NHS dental services in many areas, and that does include the area of Dumfries and Galloway, as I can hear the Member to this side of me shouting from a sedentary position. We have already seen improvements from the framework that we have put in place. We've seen a positive impact. I've already heard that Dumfries and Galloway have received expressions of interest for potential grant funding, for opening new dental practices, which the Scottish Government will absolutely be in a position to fund if applications are uh, successful. But as well as that, it's our intention to make formal representation to the UK Government for dentistry to be included in the shortage occupation list. And we've also have the CDO and Act of discussions with the General Dental Council to support them in speeding up the application process for, to clear the General Dental Council backlog. Thank you. Question number five has been withdrawn. Question number six, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last assessed access to GP services in rural areas. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government published the Health and Care Experience Survey 2021-2022 in relation to people's experience of GP services last year. Health boards and health and social care partnerships are responsible for planning and delivering primary care medical services, and the Scottish Government would expect them to make use of the Health and Care Experience Survey to identify any particular issues with access, including, of course, in rural areas. Rona Mackay. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Tweker, in my constituency, has been without a GP surgery since 2019. The ever-growing village is in a semi-rural area on the border between East Dumbartonshire and North Lanarkshire. The only option for residents is to register in one practice in Colsaith or between two practices in Kirk and Tilloch, both some miles away. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that residents deserve a better service than this and that the HSCPs and health boards in the two local authority areas should work together to find an acceptable solution? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I agree uh, that they should uh, work together. There are obviously options available to the Health and Social Care Partnership and uh, the Health Board uh, there. If there are discussions that are needed with my primary care team and primary care officials, then of course I'll make sure they make themselves available uh, to the Health and Social Care Partnerships, the local authorities involved and the Health Board. Sandesh Gohani. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary's failure to deliver the new GP contract is the real reason why the British Medical Journal are saying there's a decline in the reported quality of some respects of care in Scotland, with rural areas hit hardest. 
It is not the fault of overworked practices, but the Cabinet Secretaries, who's compounded the error by cutting £65 million from the primary care budget. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to reinstating this crucial £65 million to primary care? What, what a brass neck, presiding officer. The reason we had to reprofile our money was because of the economic vandalism of the Conservative Party, which meant that our government budget was worth less by the amount of £1.7 billion because Thank that you. lot crashed our economy. That is a brass neck and a half. So what are we doing, presiding officer? More GPs per head in Scotland than any other part of the UK. 3,220 multidisciplinary team staff members recruited here in Scotland. So yes, we will continue, the SNP government will continue the record investment in health and social care. And I'll leave it to the Conservatives to moan from the sidelines. Question number seven, Stephen Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the status of NHS Forth Valley since its escalation to stage four of NHS Scotland's national performance framework. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. Yes, I'm happy to provide uh, an update. There are some signs of improvement in performance with, uh, within NHS Forth Valley. Uh, an example in children and adolescent mental health services. Uh, we've seen some improvements in terms uh, of uh, waiting lists, not where we want it to be, but certainly there have been some improvements. This and other work has been taken forward by the Assurance Board and the exper external support team chaired by Christine McLaughlin. Uh, in that role, she has engaged with a wide range of stakeholders, including local authority chief execs, uh, the Area Partnership Forum, compromising of local trade union representatives. Stephen Kerr. The RCN and Unison reported very serious concerns over unsafe practices and a culture of intimidation. And an ind independent review found a culture of fear. And the BBC Scotland disclosure programme on the NHS was grim viewing. In it, a trade union representative at Forth Valley said that staff were watching patients die and did not feel they had been able to provide a decent high-quality care. Clinical teams have spoken out about wards short of staff and unsupported, patient safety at risk, and staff on duty pushed to breaking point. In November, vacancies were over 10% of registered nurses and nearly 14% for doctors. Can the Cabinet Secretary honestly say he believes the culture at Forth Valley has changed? And what are today's vacancy rates at Forth Valley for doctors and nurses? Cabinet Secretary. Stephen Kerr uh, does raise some really important points. It's precisely the reason why I took the decision to escalate Forth Valley to the second highest level of escalation. And one of the reasons, uh, of course, for that escalation was culture. Uh, so it's, he's absolutely right uh, to raise these issues. And Forth Valley have brought forward an improvement plan. Uh, I'm happy, if he wishes, I'm happy to arrange a meeting between, between himself uh, and Christy McLaughlin, who's uh, leading that assurance board, uh, that oversight board. There have been some improvements. I've also met with the whistleblowing champion uh, at Forth Valley to reiterate uh, this government's commitment uh, to whistleblowing and to ensure that staff's concerns and anxieties are raised through the appropriate channels. But if it is helpful to Mr Kerr, I am happy for to, to arrange a uh, discussion between uh, Mr Kerr and Christine McLaughlin. Question number eight, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what plans are in place to eliminate any spillages of sewage from the sewage network into rivers and lochs. Minister Mary McCallum. <clears throat> Thanks, Presiding Officer. As I have reported previously to Parliament, the River Basin Management Plan set out our long term aims for improving water environment. Uh, the plans are supported by Scottish Waters Improving Urban Waters Route Map, which commits to half a billion pounds of investment to improve wastewater treatment works, address unsatisfactory discharges, and increase monitoring. Scottish Water has published its first annual report on progress against the route map in December 2022, and this is on its website. Colin Beattie. I thank the Minister for her response. I understand Scottish Water has committed to installing a further 10,000 spill monitors by the end of 2024. Can the Minister advise what support the Scottish Government is providing Scottish Water to achieve this? Minister. Uh, yes, Presiding Officer, in line with its improving urban waters route map, Scottish Water has identified the priority locations for 1,000 new CSO monitors and installation will be completed by the end of 2024. Scottish Water's programme, their investment programme, is supported by up to £1.3 billion of lending from Scottish Government across 2021 to 2027 period. And, Presiding Officer, as, it is, um, as this week we mark World Water Day, 
and Scotland's role as a hydro nation. I should like to put on record uh, my thanks to everybody who works in Scotland's water industry, who have seen our overall water quality at 66 per cent, compared to the equivalent figure of just 16 per cent in England, who have 99 per cent of bathing waters now classified as sufficient or better, and for the up to £147 million which is to be invested in further wastewater improvements by 2027.